Hey guys, welcome back. Um, so it's time to talk about something that about half of the class has probably had enough of, and the other half, half of the class will never have enough of, and that is talking about Toledo in World War II. Um, as you guys are well aware, my good friend, uh, uh, <laughs> Dr. Joanna Rosenhaus wrote the book on, on Toledo in World War II, and uh, I was lucky enough to be able to help her with that research. So this is a, this is a topic that I know a little bit about. And it's a topic I really like to talk about. So we're going to talk a little bit about Toledo's war, um, how the war shaped Toledo and how Toledo shaped the outcome and the course of that war. So first of all, I want to talk about why um, I get asked a lot why World War II is such a big thing for me. And uh, then shortly after that, I'm almost always asked, well, you never served in the army. So what do you how are you an expert? Why do you care? And I always kind of come back to this. Most oncologists have never had cancer, okay? Most people who become cancer doctors haven't had cancer at that point in their lives. Uh, that's just a fact, all right? So do we say to oncologists, well, you've never had cancer. Why should you be studying it? Um, we don't. Then the other thing is um, people generally assume if you're really into military history that you must love war. And again, I go back to oncologists. I double dog dare you to find an oncologist who is like, I love cancer. I wish everybody had it. Cancer is awesome. You are not going to find that person, okay? What you are going to find many times, you're going to find that an oncologist is a person who had an aptitude for science from a young age um, as they were trying to figure out what they wanted to do that was meaningful in their lives. Uh, they decided to become a doctor. As they narrowed down what kind of doctor they wanted to be, many oncologists had a family member with cancer, and that was an inspiration for them to go into oncology to stop cancer. Um, I would say that for a lot of people who study military history, it's the same thing. Um, we found something that is scary, that we are kind of passionate about that we want to keep from happening again. And so we study it and we try to tell stories from it because they're incredible stories, just like there are incredible stories in cancer um, from the very beginnings of, of um, radiation therapy and the very beginnings of chemotherapy and the very beginnings that we're living through right now with immunotherapy. These are exciting. They're cool stories, how they've figured out how to do things. If you, um, if you read like the story of Dr. Emmanuel Carpentier, she's a, a researcher who figured out the sequencing um, that, that you need to do to be able to do some gene editing and stuff, the CRISPR gene editing. These are fascinating stories. They're amazing stories. They're triumph, triumph of the human spirit, um, triumph of the human intellect. And they're great stories. It doesn't mean we love cancer. Um, so when we find that lots of people in this life are going to research things they hate, and, um, you know, make something they really despise their life's work. Uh, it's not because they love it. Uh, it's because they, they, they really don't want it to happen again, but they find it fascinating nevertheless. So that's kind of why I'm into uh, the Second World War. Now, I have personal reasons, too. Uh, as I think I've told this class, um, in my grandfather's generation, virtually everybody's life was touched by the war. And one of my uncles, uh, one of my great uncles was killed in the war. Uh, three of my other uh, great uncles served. Uh, my grandfather worked in the war, and my mom was was born in a, a, a war post. So it, it's something that is pretty personal for me, and it is something that I, I really, I don't like war, but I sure do enjoy studying it and trying to find ways for us to learn from it. So let's talk about World War II itself. World War II, uh, especially in the past 20 years, uh, has really been painted as something romantic, like the last good war. It was the last last time the good guys and the bad guys were clear, and everybody in America came together, and everything was awesome here. And I really want to disabuse you of that notion right now. Um, world War II was not a good war. It was a bad war, like every war. Um, world War II did not bring everybody in America together. Not every American was on board with what we were doing, some for good reasons, some for bad reasons. Um, in Germany, not everybody was a Nazi. Um, some fought against the Nazis. Some did not. Um, there were good and bad people in every nation, just as there are today. Um, not everyone came together. In Germany, in the Soviet Union, in the United States, in Great Britain, not everybody did come together. 
there were people who were outliers. Um, so what can we learn from those outliers? What can we learn from the majority? What can we learn from the people who didn't come together at that time? What does that tell us for the future? Um, and then finally, boy, this is, uh, this is really the hard part. Uh, the war itself didn't solve any problems. It's hard to admit, um, but the wars themselves do not typically deal with the problem. The wars are part of the toolbox of dealing with the problem. A toolbox that includes diplomacy, a toolbox that includes um, how people in a country perceive something. So when the when the people in Germany were done with fighting, it's it's over. And that is that related to the war itself? Absolutely. It's related to the military fighting, but war is a lot bigger than than fights on battlefields. Here's a quote I want to start us out with that, and the reason I'm starting, because I'm not trying to make this into the history of World War II, I want to get you guys into the Toledo mindset here. Um, you might be familiar with H.G. Wells, who's a very famous British science fiction author who wrote War of the Worlds and stuff. And um, H.G. Wells came on a speaking tour of the United States in 1940, and he spoke to the Toledo Women's Club, which I believe, and I could be wrong, I believe they met in the ballroom at the Commodore Perry Hotel. Um, H.G. Wells gives this speech to these women in Toledo. And he says, The danger to the United States at present lies not in direct invasion on the coast, over which possibility New Yorkers need lose no sleep, Mr. Wells said. He feared, rather, a threat to democratic institutions fostered within the country or by gangsters and adventurers in nearby points. The war in the world today, as Mr. Wells sees it, is not between Hitler and the democracies, but rather a struggle between creative intelligence and Toryism, a struggle which is going on in all countries, he explained. The Tories in Germany gave Hitler his first boost to power, he pointed out, continuing that it is thanks to Tories in the United States that Chinese children have been blown to pieces by shells made in America, and thanks to Tories in England that medical aid has been denied the Chinese. Due to the political systems in England and the United States, there are reactionaries in key positions in both countries, he said. Now, much of which I just read to you probably comes across as gobbledygook to you. So let's go back and understand what he's saying a little bit. Wells, in that first paragraph, the first bullet point, says that America doesn't need to worry about the Germans invading from the sea. What he's worried about is the threat to democratic institutions, things like elections and the media. Um, he was very concerned about these things and that it would be what he called gangsters and adventurers in nearby points that would threaten it. So it wasn't the war itself that Wells thought could kill the United States. It was somebody within the United States or close to the United States attacking our institutions, destroying democracy, destroying elections, destroying the media, um, destroying a system of free and fair debate. Uh, where the facts reign. That's what Wells was worried about. Now, in the next graph, he identifies who the fight was between. And Wells said that the war is not between Hitler and the democracies, but a struggle between creative intelligence and Toryism. Now, creative intelligence, you guys can probably come up with a picture in your mind of what that is, but Toryism might be a little different to you. So, Tories back in Great Britain are a political party, and, and Wells is British. And the Tories back in the day, um, today they sometimes use Tory to represent uh, people who are in the British Conservative Party. Um, but Toryism back in the day basically meant like a hyper-nationalism and a devotion to a past that never existed. So the Tories were always basically about, well, you know, we need to take things back to the time of Richard the Lionhearted. We need the monarchy to really take charge and show the people what's what. We need the dukes and the duchesses and the princes and the princesses. We need them to regain power because democracy is a failure. All right. They were basically saying everything. The Tory perspective is let's turn back the clock a couple hundred years. Let's let's go back to a benevolent, a benevolent king in charge and dukes and duchesses, and all of the poors should just sort of understand what they are and do what they're told. Um, this position in the United States is sometimes called being a reactionary. 
And that's the phrase that he uses at the very end. Um, reactionaries in key positions. Reac being reactionary basically means being devoted wholly to the past, being anti-democratic, where you do not want democracy. You want a select group of people who make decisions no matter what. Um, and you want those people to be from the majority group. Um, reactionaries have no problem using violence to achieve those means. It's part of being a reactionary. Um, and he identifies Tories in Britain as being reactionaries as well. Um, so he says here, the Tories in Germany gave Hitler his first boost to power. And you go, what? Germany had a Tory party? No, they didn't. But Germany had these reactionary, super conservative, kind of backwards looking folk who looked back to the time of Vikings as those were Germany's glory days. We need to get back to that. We need to get back to this like kind of form of proto-Christianity throughout the country. And we need to find our roots with the Vikings and uh, Richard Wagner's operas and, and all these things. We need, we need to get back to that. We need to go back in time. We need to go back to tradition and we need to do it whatever way possible and take out anybody who's, who's different. So the Tories in Germany gave his first, Hitler his first boost to power. Uh, Tories in the United States have blown the Chinese children to shells. Well, why is this? Um, because the United States was arming the nationalist Chinese. Uh, and the uh, United States was uh, providing weapons kind of uh, around the world in different ways uh, before the war, uh, despite the neutrality acts. Um, and then thanks to Tories in England, that medical aid has been denied to the Chinese because the Tory perspective is always, why help people in other countries? Uh, our country is the only one that matters because our country is superior to every other form of life on earth. So Wells is painting this whole war as not being Hitler versus the United States or Britain. He says it's the struggle in every country and just the most obvious form of it is what we're seeing between Hitler and the United States. So what did World War II do? Number one, it was an emergency moment. And in emergency moments in a nation, you learn a lot about that nation. Um, there's an old saying that crisis reveals character, that when something bad happens to you in your life, your character has already been developed. That crisis is not developing your character. The crisis is showing what was already there. So you get somebody who has both of their legs blown off in a war and they come back and become a distance runner and stuff. It's not that getting their legs blown off made them courageous. They were already courageous and the crisis revealed that. Um, this is true all the time. And it's also true in the inverse. Something bad happens in somebody's life and they lash out and do crazy stuff. It's not that the event made them that way. Those things were already in there in the first place. When we think about society, when we think about the United States and crisis reveals character, when you look at how America responded to the Great Depression at first, crisis reveals character. People didn't help because that wasn't in them in the beginning. Um, and when we look at leaders in American history who were kind of thrust into greatness like Abraham Lincoln, the Civil War didn't make Abraham Lincoln great. He was already great, but the crisis showed us that. Um, George Washington, as you guys well know, if you're in my American history class, Washington was a terrible general and soldier in his early days. Um, and crisis revealed his.